All right. Welcome, everyone, to our Tuesday talk. I'm Michael Robinson, the career coach here at Easter Seals Veteran Staffing Network, VSN for short, and I'll be your host and presenter. In this session, we're going to discuss how to think like a employer. But before we talk about that, I'd like to take a moment to cover some housekeeping items. This webinar will last approximately 45 minutes with a live 15 minute Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions before then, please pop those into the chat. I'll break periodically to address them if I see a lot being chatted. Lastly, let us know how we're doing by filling out the end of session survey. Here's a little bit about me. I am a retired Marine with the majority of my post-military career having been in HR. I've held the positions as a recruiter, hiring manager, and career counselor. Um, my last position before joining Easter Seals, I was part of the Transition Assistance Program, um, also known as TAP, as a facilitator. And I taught more than 100 workshops to over 2,000 transitioning service members during that time frame. Now, let me introduce the VSN to you. The VSN, we understand the employment challenges that veterans and military spouses face because we too are veterans and military spouses. We've matched over 2,700 qualified candidates to fill temporary to permanent contract and direct hire positions. The fees from those placements are then directly reinvested into the coaching services, which has allowed the VSN to have coached more than 15,000 veterans, wounded warriors, and military spouses. And this leads me to where I fit in. Our career coaching program isn't just about landing a new job. It's about helping people figure out what they, true, what they truly want, what makes them happy, and how they can contribute meaningfully so that hopefully they won't be looking for work for a very, very long time. Our process is to help people gain clarity on their career by understanding the core aspects of the employment process, what you see here on the screen. Then they can take control of their job search and reach those career goals. As such, we can help you craft an effective job search strategy, an aspect that is often overlooked by many in the job search is thinking like an employer. And this simply means just view things from the employer's point of view. If you can see things from the perspective of the recruiter or the hiring manager, then you can position yourself to become the candidate of choice. Our agenda for today, we are going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is, I'm losing my voice here. We are going to talk about the communications gap between the job seeker and the employment or the employer. Then we'll talk about four aspects of what I call employer engagement. And this helps job seekers uh, in the discovery, attraction, interest, and decision phases of the job search. So, to begin, the root cause of most job search issues is the communication between the job seeker and the employer. Each has a perspective that centers on their own needs. This process typically starts when the employer posts a job, then the job seeker responds by applying to the position. Imagine this scenario. An employer posts a very generic, nondescript, part-time job for, say, a customer service representative. A job seeker applies, the HR recruiter calls the applicant for a phone screening. The conversation might go like this after the initial introductions are over. So the HR representative says or asks, so what's your work availability? And the job seeker responds, um, I'm only to I'm only able to work Thursday and, and Fridays and I, I don't do Sundays. So the employer is thinking, well, I need somebody who's going to meet our business needs. And then the job seeker says, oh, by the way, I can only work 10 to 6. OK, <laughs> employers thinking to themselves, 
Well, I need people that's going to show up on time. And then the HR representative might ask, well, what are you looking for in your next position? This is what the response might be. Well, I'm looking for uh, a way to develop new skills. And the employer's thinking, well, we need people that already have the skills to do the job. Then the HR representative might ask, well, do you have any questions for me? That might, and they might respond, well, how much do you pay? And the response there might be, well, it depends on the experience. And ladies and gentlemen, that is where the career gap or the communications gap lies. Job seekers want flexibility. Employers want dependability. Job seekers want career development and, and, and opportunities. And employers want, well, skilled workers. Job seekers want to know what the pay scale is. And employers want to scale the pay. So that is the communications gap. And a method for us to bridge that communications gap is to engage employers beginning with the discovery, discovery aspect. So in this part, it is really about one, us as a job seeker being discovered by an employer. In part of that, it's also about the employer discovering us as a job seeker. So there's gonna be two sides that I'm gonna cover in each of these segments. To begin, first, we should probably build ourselves a target job list. And you wouldn't believe how many people just don't do this. And what does this do for us? Well, firstly, it clarifies our priorities. We need to make sure that we understand everything from the location down to what we want to wear to work. Research the companies of interest, and it doesn't necessarily mean or have to be a lot of companies, 10 to start out with, and then we can grow it from there. The idea behind it is, is that we want these uh, employers to be able to meet our criteria. And then we want to engage those employers in a targeted marketing campaign. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the session. Part of this also is to engage our network. And that means visiting LinkedIn and finding connections that maybe might be connected to that targeted company as employees or might work with them as vendors. Nonetheless, we want to make sure that we are targeting, and yes, I'm using the word targeting, targeting individuals, not stalking them, but targeting individuals that have a connection to those employers. Then we want to talk with these individuals, whether those friends, neighbors, family, um, business associates, and professionals through those connections. You're going to also seek out individuals in that network for referrals. And I will talk very specifically uh, about referrals a little bit later, but referrals are going to be a key to probably finding your next role. And then lastly, we want to connect with those professionals through um, associations or uh, if you've gone uh, to college, even in, you know, look up your high school alumni, there might be some connections in there. The idea behind it is, is that we want to build ourselves a uh, network, uh, a, a web, so that we have a good understanding of where everybody is in association to those targeted companies. And this takes a little bit of work. This is not something that you're gonna be able to do overnight. Then we wanna start getting noticed by those employers. And one method to do this that's overlooked in many aspects of the job search, but is very valuable. And that's through informational interviews. So what does informational interviews do? They will help in building relationships with hiring managers. 
um, recruiters. I used to do this when I recruited also. Um, individuals would contact me and say, hey, you know, I'm getting out of the military and I was looking to move to the Hampton Roads area. Um, would it be possible if uh, I came in or you arranged a informational interview with one of your hiring managers? And I did this on occasion. It's not very difficult and most companies are, are willing to do that. So informational interviews will help you gain insider information into the fields and careers, um, a little bit more awareness about the career opportunities in that particular organization, as well as you're gonna get something that you normally probably won't get in an actual job interview. And that's feedback and advice, feedback on your resume, feedback on your cover letter, feedback on your LinkedIn profile, your interview techniques, whatever it might be. Now, informational interviews aren't um, you know, they, they don't have the same structure as a normal interview. However, you're probably going to, you know, go through the tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you find are your greatest skills and what do you find are your greatest weaknesses? All those common interview questions will probably be in that informational interview. So this is a great way to get some feedback on how you actually present yourself. Then you're going to want to optimize your LinkedIn profile. So a couple of things to understand about your LinkedIn profile. Number one, your profile photograph, you should smile. And you would be amazed at the, uh, the, the reason behind that is, is because people have a perception. And that perception is immediately gleaned from the photograph. And if you have, and I see many uh, post-military uh, military people that they get out and they still keep that drill instructor photograph on their LinkedIn profile where they have this hard stone cold face. And that doesn't um, tell an employer that this person actually has a personality or it doesn't tell uh, the viewer that they are very friendly. So you have to smile in your photograph. Your headline, this tells the reader what you are about. If, you know, the, the great thing about the LinkedIn profile is it talks about what we wanna do, our future. Whereas the resume is kind of, uh, you know, it talks about our past. So if you structure your LinkedIn profile to talk about where, what you wanna do and where you wanna go, you will find that you'll gain a lot more attention because the resume just isn't formatted in that same way. So think about that, your headline. It needs to be, uh, you know, think about it as, as, as you know, your, your road sign. Uh, as a restaurant, you want to gain those customers and direct them to where, you're, where, where you are. And that's what your headline does. And then of course you have your LinkedIn summary, uh, your work experience, and uh, your cover picture or your banner, um, as you see mine says success back there, that's one thing many people fail to put on there also. And it's a more of a personality thing. Uh, it kind of tells a little bit about you and mine is it's, it's about success. And many people say, well, what do you consider success? My success might differ from your success. Nonetheless, we need to focus on success, not failure. <laughs> um, Skills and endorsements are important, but more importantly, recommendations. Think about this, and, and I hope everyone uh, kind of understands where I'm coming from with this. So LinkedIn is the primary means in which people um, are going to basically, employers for the most part, are basically gonna judge you for, for, for initially. And think about this, you know, you Google a restaurant, you're gonna go out to a restaurant, that Google and that restaurant has one star. Now I've been to some one star restaurants and they're really, really good, but a majority of people are gonna bypass that one star restaurant. Um, so your LinkedIn recommendations act as those stars on Google. And if employers are not seeing them, and, and especially in this day and age, then they're probably gonna pass on you. So keep that in mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about recommendations here in a moment. So that's the discovery phase. We're gonna move into the attraction phase right now. 
And what this is about is now that we have discovered the organizations that we want to engage um, and hope that employers have discovered us and are looking to engage us, now comes that attraction aspect. And what does that mean? Well, remember our, when we were talking earlier, I talked about the employer putting out a job posting. That is their means of communication that they have a need. They have a position that needs to be filled. So when we find that, we need to make sure that one, by the way, if you see the uh, YouTube uh, icon up or next to, a pos uh, next to some words, that means that I have a Tuesday Talk uh, YouTube video already um, on this particular topic. And I did a whole YouTube or a, a whole Tuesday talk on deciphering job posting. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already viewed that one, uh, go back and take a look at it because it explains how to do this in depthly. However, um, for the sake of time, just briefly going to cover this. Read the entire job posting, determine your level of interest in this. If you're not interested in, in the job posting or the job itself, it's going to show. It's going to show in your resume. It's going to show when you get to the interview. And that's not necessarily a good thing. And then you want to go through this job posting and highlight the keywords and qualifications in the skills and experience section, as you see in, this, uh, in, in the image here. And verify that you meet the minimum requirements. So what does that necessarily mean, minimum requirements? Well, this usually is, is the, the top three of the requirements there you'll find are the most important. I will share that link here in a little bit, okay? Thank you. Um, and Tiffany, um, I typically don't share the slides because without the video, it kind of, <laughs> it doesn't do very well. Um, so, um, but the YouTube video is, is gonna be posted uh, after we get done with this, Tiffany. I hope that helps. Um, so I was just going through the chat because I had seen some chats pop up. Um, back to the minimum qualifications, the top, usually the top three uh, are going to be the most important. And if it deals with technical skills, those are must-haves in most cases. There are few cases where employers will hire someone that doesn't quite have the technical skills, um, but you have to think about if that employer is really willing to train someone in that, in that position in order to get them up to speed. And then, of course, uh, evaluate if the position meets your career goals. What this means is if you're taking this position and it really doesn't align with what your career aspirations are, you have to really ask yourself, why are you pursuing this? Is it because of the money? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? Most people use their jobs um, as stepping stones in their career. Now, if you're making a career change and or career pivots, this might be an interim uh, measure or a stopgap measure to get to that ultimate goal, but we really have to decide whether or not this is going to meet our career uh, our career needs in that career goal. Once we have deciphered the job posting, then we'll really want to take and under, try to understand what the employer wants and. Generally speaking, it will fall into these categories, the business knowledge. Do you know what that organization does? Are you technically able to perform the role itself? Are you motivated to do the work? We've heard of this thing that's called quiet quitting. I don't know if anyone uh, is familiar with this term, but evidently it's, it's quite big now. Uh, people are doing TikTok videos about that. Um, you have to understand that employers are, are, are going to be highly keen uh, to what's going on now. So they're going to be asking questions about motivation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, creativity. Uh, are, do you solve problems for your organization um, or your department, et cetera, et cetera? Adaptability and commitment. 
So <clears throat> commitment uh, can go in, can come in many different forms. Um, are you committed to your profession in that industry? Are you getting degrees? Are you getting certifications? Um, are you part of industry organizations? Um, or are you committed to your work? Do you accomplish and finish and complete tasks in a timely fashion? Do you go uh, above and beyond the, the standard uh, in order to complete those tasks? So employers are gonna to wanna to know from you how you do that. It is your job to explain how you do it to the employer. Once this is, you've thought about this and you've considered all the uh, aspects as far as what the employer is gonna want from the job uh, seeker, you as the applicant, get all the relevant information that corresponds to that particular position. Um, so, and many people have a, uh, a dual job search. So they may be pursuing different positions in different industries. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the information that you uh, associate with this particular position is going to be relevant. Um, and some people, they still use the general resume um, and that is not going to work in today's uh, job market. So you have to be very specific with your information as to uh, how does it apply to those roles. So you're going to list your relevant accomplishments, the skills, both technical and transferable that apply to that position. Make sure that you are using uh, industry related keywords. And that is so important. These action words uh, describe uh, what your tasks were and how you accomplished those. And don't forget to put metrics in there. So metrics are wonderful because it can easily translate into how these things work. So if uh, you tell or explain or show in a resume how you save time, money, um, percents and increases and anything else, using those numbers, are gonna convey and it conveys it very quickly. And then of course, results. This is the so what or the impact factor. Why was this important to that organization? So many people just put that they you know, saved you know, X amount of money, but they don't put what the result of that was. How was that helpful to that organization? Again, we have to connect the dots for the recruiters and the hiring managers as to what your performance was like and what your productivity was like. That's what they're gonna to wanna to know. And then any awards and honors that you may have received, regardless of how small it was. I get people all the time, well, I was, um, you know, I won employee of the month four times uh, in, in the past year. Okay, that's great. Put that on your resume. Employers wanna see that, but most people just kind of brush it off nonchalant. Um, and that sometimes is a mistake because remember, we want some people find it very difficult to uh, toot their own horn. And in this day and age and this market, you're going to have to toot your own horn because nobody else is going to do it for you. From this point, you'll need to apply. Uh oh, <laughs> one of my animations has gone rogue. Um, we'll get to that here in a moment. Um, from that point, you're going to have to tailor the resume to the job description. So don't use that general resume, target your resume. And this is important because it needs to be keyword optimized with industry specific words for that particular role. And I've heard it from so many people all the time that this is that they struggle with this because they really don't understand the uh, little nuances that is to get their resume through the applicant tracking system. Um, but it's important. Of course, use that relevant industry information. If you are changing uh, careers, many uh, military people run into this problem with translating their what they did in the military into civilian speak. They could have done the same job, but they have they use the military terminology, which doesn't translate in the civilian sector. 
So civilians aren't necessarily going to be able to um, quietly, uh, quite uh, easily evaluate that person's skills. You'll want to um, logically organize it and make it easy to read using standard uh, resume sections, such as your summary, your experience, education. Don't do anything crazy or put any different than that because the applicant tracking system um, won't necessarily pick that information up. And using keywords, industry specific keywords, relevant industry information and standardized or standard uh, sections will optimize your resume for the applicant tracking system. These are key points in making sure that your application makes it through that screening process. And once it does that, then you will probably move into the uh, next phase of the recruiting process. And hopefully you'll get that call from the recruiter. In addition to your resume, the cover letter oftentimes is overlooked. And if you are not using cover letters, I would definitely encourage you to use them. These are um, very valuable in this day and age in the job market. Um, and what I find most people doing is, is they copy and paste their resume or portions of their resume into the cover letter. And that just isn't the right way to go about sending your cover letter. Um, what employers want to see is that you have relevant work experience and the skills. Yes, they can look at your resume and glean that, but how you convey that in your cover letter, what the cover letter does that the uh, resume doesn't is that it adds a little bit of personality. The resume is kind of rigid and it's kind of formatted in a certain way. Well, your cover letter allows you to kind of express uh, key elements of your work experience that your resume just can't in a, uh, in, in a personable way. So that's the key behind the cover letter. You want to make sure that your qualifications relate to the position, that you show enthusiasm, <laughs> you know, not that it's, it can't be a cookie cutter cover letter because the, re the recruiter or the hiring manager is just going to see that. Your enthusiasm has to show as to why you really want to work at that, um, that, that, that employer. And then, of course, you have to explain how you fit that role through uh, your experience or, um, you know, uh, that you have the ability to do the work. So um, those things are important when it comes to your cover letter. All right. So moving to networking. Net networking is going to be the uh, probably key in this day. And it, in fact, it is. I'm just going to say it. networking is key. Now, before many, many years ago, 10, 20 years ago, um, people were, I don't need anybody to help me out in my job uh, search. In this day and age, you need people to help you out in your job search, and that's going to come from your network. More importantly, networking with recruiters is, is, is probably one thing that most people overlook as well. Because, you know, I know uh, if you've ever been in a military or associated with a military, recruiters kind of get a bad rap because everybody <laughs> believes that the recruiter did them wrong in some form or fashion when they were recruited. So recruiters kind of get a negative uh, uh outlook but you have to you have to network with them one just to network with them two if you're inquiring about a position that a job whether it's open or not because some uh jobs on these websites uh they stay up there forever and they might already be closed it's just that the organization hasn't taken it down from the web from the uh career or not the career site but 
uh, the job board, such as Indeed or Glassdoor. Now, Indeed and Glassdoor do a really good job in trying to police this stuff, but that position might already be closed and you're trying to apply for it and you're not going to be able to get anywhere. Um, so inquiring about uh, job positions before and after submitting your application, that's always a good thing. Remember, it's up to the recruiter whether or not they're going to accept that request. Ask them to facilitate warm introductions between you and hiring managers. This is a great way, remember going back uh, to that discovery phase as well, this all blends in. If you can you know, get warmly introduced to those hiring managers, um, that's just gonna build that uh, attention and discovery also. And then of course, this one I used to love. You may not necessarily be quite ready to fill that role, um, or you may not even uh, be in that industry, but if you have a connection with someone that might be able to fill that role, offer a referral. Wonderful. Referrals, and I'll explain this here in a few moments, referrals are going to be, uh, are a recruiter's best friend. So if you can do that, that's going to make you even, and recruiters are going to remember this. So uh, when you have that opportunity or that opportunity presents itself, and hopefully that recruiter is still there, they're going to remember that you uh, aided their, um, their, their task in finding someone for those roles. Make it part of your everyday life. There are opportunities to network all around us. If you're standing in, uh, you know, you're shopping and you're standing in the, the checkout line, the people that are around us, you never know who you might bump into. So um, also dedicate time for socializing. Set networking goals. And what this really means is, is as you go through your job search process, maybe set three a week to meet and connect with three individuals. You might do five, you might do, you know, do 10. But if you have those goals established, then you're increasing your network. And then, of course, learn as much as you can about the individuals that you connect with. Most of the time, what happens on LinkedIn is they send a, a networking connection request, the, pe the person accepts it, and then, oh, well, we're connected. And that's where it really ends. Um, and that's really not the, the, the idea behind networking. It, the idea behind networking is, is to meet and exchange information and to get to know a little bit more about the people that you meet. So that is networking and you really need to invest in it if you're not doing it right now. So I was talking about refer, being referred and referrals earlier. Here's why. So um, referred candidates uh, typically go through the hiring process 55% of the time faster than non-referrals. So um, that's, that's great. So if you can be referred, um, that's something to look forward to. Right now, um, the, the process is lasting anywhere from um, a month to sometimes a month and a half to longer, um, depending on how senior that position is. Additionally, they're four times more likely to be hired than non-referrals. And employers love referrals, especially from trusted individuals, current employees, or alumni, those that used to work for that organization and still have a tie, maybe some bonds to that organization. So that's one reason why, even though that person may not necessarily uh, be at that company at the time, doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't still seek out a referral from them. And then of course, um, 88% of employers say that those that have been referred are above average applicants. And here's another thing, uh, it's not on here, but I'll go ahead and let you know, uh, those that are referred oftentimes are retained by the company a lot longer than non-referred individuals. And it's been in the research has been proven that those that um, are referred um, are happier in, their, in those jobs that they get referred to than non-referred. So those are other reasons why being referred is uh, of value and it's something that you can gain through your network. So how do we get referred? Well, 
first of all, we want to start with who we know, um, determine what their connection is to the job or the department that we're applying to. So the if it's someone that's directly in that department, that's great. That's what we want to aim for. The further uh, remove that individual that is going to refer you from that uh, position, uh, the less relevance that has. It doesn't necessarily mean not to ask, um, but we need to make sure that the closer it is to that department, to that position, um, the more emphasis is going to be given to that referral. And then you want to ask that person before you use them in either a cover letter or on your application or mention their name. You want to ask them permission to use them as a referral. All right, just don't go around name dropping and that person doesn't know you from Adam or never gave you permission. Now the hiring manager is asking them about you and they're like, I don't know this person. That's going to look very bad for you. And we don't want that to happen. And then, of course, um, ask your network on LinkedIn. This is probably going to be one of those. Um, you know, again, the, the closer they are connected to the, the organization, the better that's going to be. Sometimes it's going to be a cold contact um, that you're asking individuals for referrals. But most organizations have a referral program where, where um, the employee that's making the referral and if that person is hired that they referred they get uh, a reward or money a bonus or something to that effect so uh, current employees of the organization are going to be on the lookout for uh, top talent as well so those are your different avenues for being referred let's move um, i know we're running a little bit short on time but um, i will move um, a little bit explanation can, I, can yes, I just add a quick then. question so if yes. you have permission to use a referral, do you put their name in the cover letter? You just mentioned it quickly. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Name drop, name drop any chance you get. <laughs> so um, now interest. So we've gone through the discovery. We've gone through the attraction phase. Now this is when the recruiter or the hiring manager picks up the phone and gives this person a, a call. This is the interest phase or aspect of things. Some of the reasons why people fail interviews, they aren't very well prepared. In other words, they don't practice. Uh, they don't research the company, big failure. Um, in fact, the next Tuesday talk I'm gonna cover is how to research uh, organizations. Uh, and, and it's called, do you really wanna work there? And that's the next one that's going to be uh, on the, the 18th of, of this month. But more importantly, they come off as being entitled or self-centered. There's uh, a point where being confident and being cocky are, are they're totally two different things. So this could be off-putting to the person that's interview them, interviewing them. Um, and then, of course, they don't emphasize their genuine interest in the company. Remember when I was talking about earlier, that you, you probably want to be enthusiastic about this. Uh, it shows in the interview, whether it's over the phone, uh, virtual, or in person, they're going to know. And I've interviewed plenty of people where I just knew they weren't into it. And that has a, a, a negative connotation uh, to the interviewer. And then lastly, they can't articulate why they want to work there. That is a problem. And if you can't do that, um, why are you, again, applying to that position? So with this being said, why, what do employers want to know in the interview? Why you apply to the role, you know, what you're looking for in a new job. If you've been out of work for a while, why were you out of work for a while? Um, and then, of course, why do you believe that you're qualified? That's a big one your relevant achievements that you're proud of, these are gonna be the ones that you're gonna talk about in the interview. And then of course, what skills can you apply to the role? Now you should have already assessed this, but I will say this again, in this job market where people are just uh, shotgunning their resumes and applications out, um, they don't all the time, and they don't do that 
deciphering the 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 job posting if you can't explain it in an interview it's going to be a problem so what do we do about this well <laughs> One way to help out is through mock interviews. This allows you to practice. Practicing interviewing. Interviews are a skill. And if you don't necessarily um, practice, you're going to get rusty. And what most people do whenever they find a job and get in a job, they fail, they, they, they stop interviewing. And two or three years later, now they're looking for a new job. So in order to get good at interviewing, you have to interview. And this is where this practice comes in. Some of the things that practice does is it reduces stress. It reduces anxiety. It will boost your confidence because you've practiced it. Yeah, you're still going to be a little nervous and you're still going to have butterflies in your stomach. Even to this day and age, I still um, have that. Then, but you're going to be more confident and able to uh, go through your background and what excites you about that role a little bit better. And then, of course, um, you'll be able to prepare for those behavioral interview questions, such as tell me about a time when you solved a problem for your department or tell me about a time you did this. Those behavioral interview questions are more common. Um, and if you're not prepared for those, uh, you're probably not going to do very well in the interview. Also, use the LinkedIn interview preparation tool. Many people, many people don't know about this. It allows you to, it provides uh, videos and articles from hiring managers and experts uh, in, in industries or just in general that allows you to practice and answer common interview questions. It also allows you to record this, or you can do the response in writing, and you'll get feedback from artificial intelligent, um, a artificial intelligent feedback system. So you will record your answer to or your response to a question, and then that will give you instant feedback as far as your facial expressions, your tone of voice. If you use Filler words like um and so and all these other words uh, more than you should probably do in an interview. And lastly, and probably one of the best features about this is you can privately send uh, this to first degree connections to get some feedback from them. So you can send your video or you can send your written responses to questions. This is a absolute wonderful tool. In addition to this, part of your interview preparation should be learning about what's being offered in the industry and for similar roles. Here are a few. Um, there are much more. Nonetheless, these are probably the most well-established. And you're going to want to know this information. So salary.com, Indeed. I, and I would advise using more than one. And when I was recruiting, I also used to do the compensation packages as well. And I used a blended approach uh, to all of these, meaning um, use five of these, um, find out what the lowest is, find out what the highest, and you can just do those averages. And that will generally give you a solid um, range that you can go into the interview with. Some of the main focal points from the interview, focus on professionalism. The first impression is going to be the lasting impression. So if you don't hit it off right, it's pretty hard to go back and do any do-overs. Um, accomplishments and your contributions, those are going to be very valuable. Offerings of your value. This is where most people miss the mark in the interviews. What can you offer that employer that's going to be of value to them? Yes, you might have tons of work experience, but if you don't express how you can help that organization, then they don't see any value in you. Uh, so it's not necessarily the most qualified person that gets uh, selected. Oftentimes, it's the person that can convey their value to the organization better. 
Uh, so keep that in mind. And then of course, express the interest. You have to be interested in the role. Your communication is being assessed through your cover letter, your application, and your resume. Those are gonna be your written um, communication evaluations. And then of course, how you present yourself in the interview. Self-presentation, going back to the first impression and your professionalism. And then be likable. What does this mean? Well, if you don't have that smile, if you're not pleasant, if you don't greet people, um, it's, it's gonna be difficult. And believe it or not, in most cases, the uh, decision is based on who they like the most from those interviews. And I've experienced it a few times. I used to do uh, government contract recruiting and uh, they may have hired someone that the hiring manager absolutely did not like, but it was because of the skill set and the government client wanted them, not because the hiring manager actually made a connection with that individual. Um, and those are very rare cases. These are individuals that were uh, scientists and all kinds of you know engineers that had high level uh, experience, but they had no personality, and <laughs> that uh, was was difficult for the hiring manager to do because the hiring manager, even though they were the project manager, had to um, uh, basically do what the client wanted them to do, which was to hire the person. And it is what it is. So being likable is, uh, is, is, is one of those things that you can't underestimate in the interview. What happens if you get asked the interview question or the salary question in the interview? Well, first thing you want to do is you're going to attempt to delay um, that conversation. If not, then maybe you're in that third round. We want, we want to get the employer to reveal their hiring range first. Uh, so delay, if you can't delay, then try to get them to tell you what they're looking at hiring. If you're pressed in giving a number, use your high end of your salary research. And what I mean by this is maybe you researched a, a position and they are paying 50 to 60,000. So in that interview, I'm going to say 60 to 70,000. You wanna know why? Because the recruiter or the hiring manager is gonna hear that lower number and that's what they're gonna go with. So if you uh, use 50 to 60, they're gonna look at 50. And if 50 isn't gonna meet your needs, then you're, it's gonna be a tough battle to negotiate uh, higher from that point. Um, not saying it's impossible, but just keep that in mind. You always wanna follow up with, um, you're gonna be flexible or negotiable. And then lastly, uh, practice. Be prepared for those uh, scenarios. The last portion of this is the decision portion. So what's the hiring criteria? Well, work history. If your work history, if you've uh, you know, got a spotty work history or you have no relevant work history, that's going to weigh on that decision. Years of related experience. Well, your work history might tell something, might be in a different industry. But if you have related work experience and you can convey that in your application and your resume, that might be enough to meet that hiring criteria. So if it calls for five years of this, maybe you've got 15 years in a different industry, but you have a related work experience that you could convey for that five years of experience. Now you meet that criteria. Is it a skills match? Your work style and ethics. So if that organization is highly collaborative, but you like to work alone, well, you may not necessarily, that work style may clash. And then ethics, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are conveying uh, ethical approaches in the way that you do work. And sales is a big one because if you're in sales, and I've been in sales before too, there's a lot of things that are done that can be ethically <laughs> questionable. Um, so you have to understand that 
how you convey that information to the uh, to the hiring manager or the recruiter um, may not necessarily be the same way that they do things at that organization. So you have to you have to be aware of this. Your salary expectation, if you're too high, well, that could put you outside of consideration. If you're too low, well, you could be leaving a lot of money on the table and basically underselling your value to that organization. And lastly, the strength of your recommendations and your references. If you don't have anybody to speak on your behalf, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. In this day and age, uh, many times, and this is just not um, what you put on your application. What you put on your application, employers, yes, they do that to check and verify that you actually, actually work for that organization and all those things. But they're generally going to want to have someone that they can talk to um, about you as a person, as a employee. And if you can't provide that, that's going to be problematic. So what do you do when you get an offer? Um, first thing you want to do is say thank you. You'd be surprised at how many people fail that step. They don't say thank you. Um, and avoid saying yes, unless you are absolutely confident that that's going to be the right choice. Otherwise, ask for time, usually a day or two, in, most case, in some cases up to a week, depending on the seniority. But understand that most organizations, they're trying to hire and they're trying to hire now. And then, of course, get it, the offer in writing, ask for the benefits brochure, and then read, absolutely read everything. Absolutely read everything. For you, you need to determine whether or not this is going to be a good fit. Does the skills, do you match the skills requirements? Is the total compensation going to fit you? Um, does the management and leadership style, does that work with you? Is that going to be something that you can, um, you know, uh, deal with on a daily basis? Security and room for growth. Is that organization going to go under in the next year or so? That's not much security in that, in that particular position. Can you grow from whether that's promoted up the, the chain or expand your skills? Location and commute, as well as that company culture and those values that that organization has. If their motto is to work hard and play hard, well, they might work to the wee hours of the morning and go out to the bar afterwards. If not, if that's not the way that you work, then that's probably not going to be a fit for you. And then lastly, what to know about negotiation? It's a the outcome should be win-win. The hiring manager gets what they want, you get what you want. There's got to be a compromise in there. Understand that the hiring manager expects to negotiate. 58% of people do not negotiate their salary. And oftentimes they are leaving money on the table. Hiring managers are nervous too. If they are making you an offer, that means they want you. And they fear that they may not be offering you or giving you what you want and that you may walk away. So they're nervous about this as well. Um, you have to understand that um, hiring managers are under constraints. They may not have the budget to pay you twenty or thirty thousand dollars more than what you're uh, more than what they're offering. So there may be other um, aspects, non-cash value aspects that you can ask for. Um, and then the initial offer usually isn't the best offer. So that's where that negotiation aspect comes in. So. Um, and I have a Tuesday talk that's going to talk about negotiating um, offers and the like. So um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Some takeaways that we need to go over. Understand the communication gap between job seekers and employers. Make yourself discoverable to employers and look for those employers. That target list is going to be uh, phenomenal once you get it built out. Position yourself to attract those employers. That means through your LinkedIn profile, your networking, and your, uh, mock, uh, your uh, informational interviews. And then, of course, ensure that you convey your interest. This is so important. If you're not interested in those roles, the employers are definitely going to, to see that. And then, of course, understand how employers make those hiring decisions. That brings us to the conclusion of today's Tuesday Talk. Here's my contact information if you have any questions or you'd like to schedule some time to speak with me. 
I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Remember, connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and share your thoughts and opinions of your experience too. Also, don't forget to complete the end of session survey. Your feedback is very important. Lastly, if you watch this on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and click the bell to be notified of any videos that are released and share your thoughts and opinions in the comments. Until next time, farewell.